right, welcome everybody to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim, and I welcome everybody to our infamous gathering tonight. Um, the College of Complexes consists of the following format. There'll be a brief announcements period. Our um, speaker will speak for up to about an hour, then we'll have question and answers. And at the end of the question and answer period, we'll uh, entertain rebuttals. With our rebuttals, we'll then um, uh, finish the meeting about nine o'clock or so, but we'll keep the Zoom call open if, because I know there's people want to chat for a while. Um, with that, uh, Charlie, if, uh, there's two rules to the college. First, number one, there's no personal attacks. Number two, one, I'm sorry, number one is one fool at a time. And number two is no personal attacks. Yeah. You think I'd be able to get that straight after all these years. <laughs> all right. So, Charlie, if you're ready with the announcements, I'll uh, get the schedule up here when you're ready. So, uh, yeah, I'm ready to go. Okay. Welcome, everyone, to meeting number 3000. Uh, 626 of uh, the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Okay, first of all, we have two e female groups, which I recommend you join one or both for one or two notices each week on the upcoming programs and schedule. We have a Google group and a meetup group, and there's instructions for joining either one right at the center top of our website. Okay, although I'm not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On July 31st, we had a little change here, but I'm been informed that Fair Vote, Fair Vote Illinois will be making a presentation on the topic of voting, vote by mail, Big lie, ballot access, ranked choice. We may add to the program. That's in progress and development, but it's all gonna be all about voting. HR1, suppression of votings and so forth. I may put together a little summary of the issues regarding it myself, which is a very short one. On August the 7th, from overseas, we'll be joined by the Young World Federalist. We want to have one government to govern control the, the entire world. For many years, I was in the World Federalist Association. Uh, so this is the young World Federalist people like with the vision and the very informative video there if you go to the website. Following that, on August the 14th, I will be speaking uh, and I'm going to, I did a, a retrospective to look at the life of the ordinary person. Does anybody know where that quote is from that says, it is we who plowed the prairies, built the cities where they trade? Does anybody know where that's from? Uh, Charlie Paydock. Sandberg. The lyrics from Solidarity Forever. But anyhow, I put together a 30 minute uh, looked going back to the cavemen of what exactly was the lifestyle uh, and how it has changed for the every every the little guy, the ordinary person. I very informative. I think discovered a lot of things about that. Okay, now here's the thing: August the 21st and 28th are presently vacant. We're booked up through September. I'm having a little difficulty locating speakers given the summer and so forth. So is the other college. If you have not spoken before and would like to, or give it a shot, this is a good opportunity. If you know of someone we should invite, please let me know. But uh, I've got two dates open. And if you can help us out by filling it in, take a position on an issue, and we'll see if you got if you got your act together. So August 21st and the 28th. Otherwise, maybe we'll go to an open mic or something like that. Us uh, heading into September, we have scheduled our regular Labor Day speaker, a veteran, 40-year veteran um, of the railway system. Mark Burroughs is returning. He spoke to us about 
um, the railroad strikes and so forth, but he's going to be talking about the organized labor movement, about our accomplishments and challenges past the present. He spoke about Debs. He's a very knowledgeable about Eugene Debs, and he's the primary officer of RWE, the Railway Workers Union. So it could, should be an animated discussion for Labor Day. On September the 11th, Oh, not again. Jim Fletcher will be returning. He is the uh, co-founder of the Academic 9-11 Truth Organization. And he's going to be talking on the topic of reality or illusion. I think all of you in the college better deal with that. Do you know about reality? Are you living in illusion in general? All right. Well, he's already Charlie, so uh, that should not be a problem for you. Yeah. All right. Moving <laughs> on. September 18th. Now they put out a nationwide magazine, which is very useful. But Green America, ecological organization and publication will be sending a representative uh, on September the 18th. And on September the 25th, we'll be featuring another author, um, Ty Larson. Uh, Wait, uh, not him. Move up, Tim. You just covered, James. You just covered. Huh? No, the 25th. Please move to the 25th. Okay. That's our 25th. James Michael Comerford and on the... Uh, yeah, all right. He's going to be talking. He did a pandemic tour of the United States. Uh, getting re reactions and responses. Lives in uh, So it's going to be God. pandemic night at the college. And again, I reiterate, we have two vacant dates. If you'd like to speak and be a catalyst to get the discussion going, we certainly would appreciate you getting in touch with me. Contact information is always available on the cover of our website. All right, Tim, that's it. Thank you very much. Take it away. All right. Uh well, Patrick, if you're ready to start speaking, I won't introduce you since everybody seems to know that you're already speaking. Roosevelt Watkins, thank you for joining us. Daniel Yana, thank you for coming. And as well as everybody else. So uh, if you're ready, uh, Patrick, go right ahead and start speaking. You got anything you want to share with us tonight as far sure. as I, screen share anything? Yes, yes, I, I do. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank the, the College of Complexes and, and everybody on this um, Zoom uh, session tonight for the opportunity to, um, to speak here. Um, this is sort of a, my speech will be a summary of some of the um, main points in my book, Profound Secrets of, of Jesus and his, uh, his inner circle. Um, and so one of the themes that I will uh, address is the resurrection of Christ. To the resurrection of Christ, I want to first um, note that in uh, the second chapter of my book, I walk my readers through uh, the proofs for the, uh, the existence of the historical, the historical Jesus. When I make reference to the historical Jesus, I'm saying that historians have reconstructed the existence of a first century Jew by the name of Jew, uh, by the name of Jesus, who was uh, from Nazareth, and that he led a religious movement and was crucified on the cross at the direction of Pontius Pilate. Um, scholars uh, are, are, are able to reconstruct that this Jesus was in fact um, baptized by another known historical figure, John the Baptist, and that um, Jesus made apocalyptic claims. Uh, we know that, that Jesus Christ interacted with um, known historical figures. Some of those, some of the people that Jesus is uh, known to have interacted, the historical figures that Jesus is known to have interacted with include Pontius Pilate, uh, John the Baptist, uh, Joseph Caiaphas, the, uh, the high priest of the Jerusalem temple, 
and the individual was referred to as James, the brother, the brother of, of Jesus. The overwhelming majority of scholars in ancient, ancient history scholars concede that Jesus did exist. I raise this because in the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, um, the, the late 19th, early 20th century gave rise to a mythicist movement that claimed that Jesus Christ uh, ne never really existed and that he was made up. Uh, this continues to be, this, this, this position continues to be rejected by archaeology and uh, historical scholars. Um, so uh, the arguments I'm making today uh, center around or are about the triumphalist Jesus or the divine Jesus. And when I talk about the triumphalist Jesus, I'm talking about the Jesus who um, healed the sick, cast out demons, raised the dead, and was himself resurrected uh, from the dead. The death and the resurrection of Christ. The core tenets of, of the Christian faith are embodied in the of the Apostles' Creed. Yep. A creed is a system of beliefs or opinions about something. A oral tradition is cultural knowledge and information that has been passed down through uh, speech from one generation to, a next, to the next. So a creed gets passed down via oral, basically through via oral traditions. The elements of the, uh, the Apostles' Creed are as follows. That God is the creator, uh, that Jesus' his son was born of a virgin, that he died on the cross, and that he was resurrected. Religious scholars and, and historians tell us that this creed, this creed um, began, as, as, uh, began as a part of the oral traditions uh, within uh, uh, shortly, um, immediately after the supposed uh, resurrection of Christ. And so, um, and within three years of the, uh, the crucifixion and in the, res within three years of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ, um, this creed uh, began to appear. People had began to talk about the events uh, surrounding the death and the resurrection of Christ in terms of the four points that I made. They talked about uh, Jesus having died on the cross and him having um, uh, been, been resurrected. And so in support of that, I, I, I cite to the work of uh, Dr. Gary uh, Habermas and Michael Lacona. So whatever you may believe about the truth of the resurrection of Jesus, People began to claim that it happened immediately after the crucifixion. Yeah. Belief was so widespread that it uh, that within two years um, it had uh, morphed into a oral tradition. Uh, the creed was specifically affirms the, the creed specifically affirms the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection uh, three, three days later. This is consistent uh, with, the, with uh, Philippians chapter two, five through eight. Chapter, in, in Philippians two, five through eight says, it reads as follows. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So what does this mean? This means that however divine Jesus might have been prior to his bodily existence on earth, during his incarnation on earth, he was obedient to death. We see that Jesus was not only obedient to, to death, but he observed other conventions, including baptism. We know um, the record establishes that Jesus sought out John the Baptist, another uh, known historical figure, and uh, so that he may and, and so that he may be baptized. So, however divine Jesus was prior to his earthly existence, 
he did, he made it the conscious choice to be, to be baptized. Jesus said, um, Jesus said that he was not here to change the law, but to follow the law. So however divine he may have been, he made the choice um, uh, to follow the law. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was besieged by Roman soldiers, he said, Jesus stated, are you not aware that I could summon legions of angels who would deliver their Lord um, from his enemies? And that's in Matthew 26, uh, 53. So however divine Jesus uh, was, he chose not to call the army of angels when his life hung in the balance. At no point, and here's a point that I'm making by all of this, at no point during his incarnation on earth did Jesus exercise any of the divine prerogatives uh, that uh, according to him were not available uh, to the rest of us. Jesus talked about having the, so, so, so moving on, what is death? What does death mean? And, and what does it mean that Jesus was obedient to death? Death is the end of life function and includes the absence of consciousness, which is the inability to exercise, to experience the, sen the, the senses. The absence of consciousness does not imply death. However, death necessarily implies or means the absence of consciousness. That which is dead and lacking conscious consciousness cannot imbue itself with consciousness. What does this mean? This means that if Jesus was in, if Jesus died on the cross, he could not resurrect himself. It follows in that if Jesus is possessed, if Jesus possessed with uh, conscious was was possessed with consciousness sufficient to resurrect himself, then he was never dead. The claim that Jesus was resurrected from the dead then means that someone or something resurrected Christ. Um, and Paul in 1 Corinthians reminds us of what's at stake here. Paul said, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you, your, first, your faith is futile, and you are still living in sin. At this point, the question becomes, who raised Jesus from uh, from the dead. The list of possible um, culprits in the resurrection of Christ is relatively short. To raise the dead requires divine supernatural powers. This limits the list of possible suspects. The list includes, the short list includes God himself, the disciples, Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene, who is, of course, of course, one of the disciples. And we will address, we will address each of these um, possible uh, suspects in turn, beginning with God. The assumption that many of us make is that God resurrected Jesus from the dead. After all, we're talking about Jesus, the beloved son of God. There is a problem with this. And the problem with this idea uh, is, con is part of the, uh, contained in the core uh, Christian belief contained in John 3.16. John 3.16, and we can, we've all heard it, we can probably all recite it. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is sacrifice. Sacrifice describes something important or precious that is given up for the sake of gaining something or allowing something to happen that is considered important. This is the essence of substitutional sacrifice. It is the idea that God gave his, uh, God gave the life of his only begotten son, Jesus, to redeem, to redeem the sins of man. Basically that Jesus died for our sins. What's the problem with this? The problem with this is that it negates the idea of redemption. If God himself, if God himself resurrected Jesus, um, 
three days after uh, he sacrificed him for our sin, then God has in his possession that which he claims to have sacrificed, his son. This means that there is no sacrifice. One cannot sacrifice the life of another and have that life at the same time. This notion runs um, contrary to the entire meaning of, of sacrifice. I sell my house, and then three days later, I decide that I want my house back, and I tell the owners that, that you have to vacate it, and by the way, I get to keep the, the thousands of dollars that, that you paid me for. One of the things, one of the things, in, 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 in one of the things that you forfeit or give up when you decide to marry is the the right to sort of randomly date. You don't marry and at the same time tell your was your husband or wife, wait, don't wait up for me because I have a date tonight. The idea, the point there are many have tried though, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. The idea that God sacrificed his son and then three days later resurrects him, then makes no sense. Where is the sacrifice if God immediately brings back his beloved uh, son? I don't mean to, to sound crass here. I appreciate that we're dealing with serious subject matter. Still, if you align yourself with the idea that God resurrected Jesus from the dead, then you have to adjust this, this obvious con uh, contradiction. During the period of sacrifice, during this period, sacrifice was not unknown. Um, the people of the covenant understood it well. The terms of the sacrifice were clearly understood by both parties. Both parties knew what they were expected to give up and what they expected to receive in turn. The Hebrew Bible describes God's uh, various covenant between um, uh, uh, with his with the with the uh, Jewish people. We are talking about um, when we're talking about people who were uh, um, knowledgeable about contract concepts. Now, here, but the dilemma, the dilemma regarding who resurrected Christ is is solvable. That someone other than God resurrected Jesus from the dead does not impact Christianity at all. The creed states that Jesus uh, was resurrected. There is no consistency. Uh, there's no consistency on who resurrected Jesus from the dead. For example, if you go to you, you go to Acts, Acts uh, 2, chapter 2, um, 24 says God did. Galatians says that the three person, the three persons of the Holy uh, Trinity did. John 2.19 predicts that Jesus raised himself from the dead. Romans says that spirit raised Christ uh, from the dead. So at this point, let's 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 just take a step back to 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 look at the core tenets. Of, of, of the Apostle Creed to determine whether or not they're still intact. God the Creator, we still have God the Creator. We still have Jesus, his son, born of a virgin. We still have, he died on the cross uh, for our sins and that he, was that he was resurrected. The Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament describe 10 resurrections, all performed by men. Most were performed by Christ. Two were performed by uh, disciples of Christ, Peter and uh, um, Peter, Peter and Paul, in the name of Christ. So, moving along on our list of suspects. So, we we've addressed God as a su suspect, and we talk about how God's involvement, in my opinion, negates rede redemption. So let's look at the disciples. Next, we come to the disciples. When we examine the list of possible suspects, we look at those who have the, uh, the, the ability, uh, those who would have been motivated, and those who had the opportunity. The sus suspects must have had all three. The exclusion of any 
one of three eliminates the possibility of responsibility. Huh? Was there a question? No, we'll, we'll, we'll go on the question. Go, go, go ahead. I mean, no, we normally have questions after the presentation. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I heard her. I, I thought I heard her. No, 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 that, that's okay. But if, okay. if somebody's, you know, we'll, we'll problem be... is that The problem is that Linda needs to mute. She's on a okay. phone call. Thanks. Okay. Bye. There you go. All right. Well, at least you can hear us. Okay. So, Patrick, please continue. Okay. And Linda, could you mute your microphone? So next we come to the next we come to the disciples. When we examine the list of possible suspects, we you know, and I think I already covered. We have to there was a mean the ability, the motive, and the opportunity. Suspects must have all three. The exclusion of any one of these three elements eliminates the possibility of responsibility. Whoever it was that resurrected Christ had motive. The absence of motive is randomness. Uh, and there was nothing random about the resurrection of Christ. The 12 disciples uh, of Jesus, in addition to Mary Magdalene, all had the means and all were similarly, would have been similarly motivated to resurrect Christ. Uh, and, and in support of that is like Matthew 10. Uh, Matthew 10, Jesus taught his disciples Two, Matthew 10 recites that Jesus taught his disciples to heal the sick, to cast out demons, and to raise the dead. Philip was one of, one of Jesus' disciples. When you look to the gospel of Philip, it indicates that Jesus taught Mary Magdalene things that he did not teach the other disciples. The gospel of Philip reveals Peter asking Jesus, why do you prefer Mary over the rest of us? Okay. All of the disciples love Jesus, so it stands to reason that they would want Jesus alive to, they would have wanted Jesus uh, alive to continue his ministry. The problem for the disciples is after the arrest of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, the trial began when it became apparent that Jesus would be put to death. All of the male disciples fled to Galilee out of fear that they too would be prosecuted and perhaps put to death. None were present at the crucifixion of Christ except Mary Magdalene, the mother of Jesus, uh, the disciple that Jesus loved, and Martha. The male disciples had alibis disciples could not have been involved in the resurrection of Christ because they were in Galilee. This leaves Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene possessed the ability to raise the dead, to heal the sick, to cast out demons. She loved Jesus and presumably, and presumably would have wanted him to, would have wanted him uh, to continue his, min his ministry. She had the opportunity. She was at the empty tomb on the day of the resurrection of Christ. We notice that Mary's decision to remain with Christ, um, uh, we, mer we notice Mary's decision to remain with Christ from the time of his trial, throughout the prosecution and the crucifixion and the burial. She was present at the tomb immediately after the crucifixion. She followed the body from Calvary to um, uh, to the, 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 uh, the tomb. Um, let's just first, let's step back, ben, let's step back a minute and, and, and for a second and, and set the stage, um, set the stage for all this uh, that we know about Mary's, for, set the stage for Mary's, why Mary's behavior during this period went against the grain. Christ, during this time, claimed that he was the Messiah. False claims that one is the Messiah were punishable by death. According to the law of the Sanhedrin, um, anybody responsible for enforcing, the, 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 wait a minute, first of all, according to the, the law of the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin was the, the body responsible for enforcing 
laws and regulations applicable to the Jewish people. The Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin was made up of two bodies uh, called, two groups called the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And in my book, I, do, I go into greater detail about uh, um, the, 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 the Sanhedrin and as a deliberative, deliberative body and the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Back to Jesus's misdeeds, alleged misdeeds. Uh, first, they included storming the temple. We all know about that. But here's something we may not know. The Talmud, the Talmud, in the Talmud, the Talmud is the, um, sort of the, uh, is the uh, central source of rabbinic Judaism. It sets forth the law and it, it's a compilation of the oral history of the Jewish people. And what do we find when we look at, we, look, we examine the Talmud? There is a prosecution document in the Talmud, uh, the Babylonian Talmud, it's in the, the Sanhedrin Tractate. It could be found in Sanhedrin Tractate 43 A and B. And what this is was an announcement, an announcement before the execution of Jesus. And it provided, this is, this is, this is a document created, um, a document or a part of an oral tradition created contemporaneous with the events of the, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. Here's, here's what that uh, prosecution document um, reads. 40 days before the execution took place, a herald went forth and cried, he is going, he is going forth to be stoned because he has practiced sorcery and entice Israel to apostasy. Anyone who can say anything in his favor, let him come forth and plead on his behalf. But since nothing was brought forth in his favor, he, Jesus, was hanged on the eve of Passover. What does this document do? This document authenticates several um, of the biblical passage related to Jesus. First, this document, along with others, establishes the historicity, the history, the historicity of Jesus. It provides evidence outside the Bible that corroborates the fact, the fact that two of the miracles um, of Jesus detailed in the Bible were actually investigated by the body response by the by the Sanhedrin, which again was a judicial uh, body responsible for investigating these claims, the Sanhedrin is replete with descriptions, descriptions and explanations of what explanations of what is described as acts of sorcery or magic done by Jesus. So, what does this tell us? What is sorcery? For someone who opposes you, sorcery is the doing of magic or the, the performance of miracles motivated by evil. If they oppose you, it's sorcery. If they're on your side, it's a miracle. This prosecution document suggests that or establishes that the claimed, um, some of the, the miracles that uh, Jesus was um, was said to have performed were contemporarily, contemporaneously investigated by the Sanhedrin. So, and and the the, the two miracles that we that we see from the uh, um, that we see in the Bible that were thoroughly investigated was one. Um, where uh, Jesus restored sight to the blind, and the other, the other, 
is the resurrection of Lazarus, Lazarus, which is detailed in the Bible. And so what we know from these, this prosecution document, this is outside of the Bible. This is from a source that, that opposed Jesus, that the, the, uh, that the, the crimes of Jesus, including the allegations of sorcerer, sorcery, were thoroughly in, in investigated. If so, say for you, say for example, you, you're a member of the Sanhedrin. There is a claim that Jesus um, raised Lazarus from the dead, attested to by several people. They were attested to by so many people that the Sanhedrin couldn't deny it. If this person hadn't been investigated by the the, the simplest way to thing for the Sanhedrin to do, which is to go, is to go grab Lazarus and say, okay, you know, you know, he's alive, you know, but that didn't happen. There are several uh, documented claims in the, um, in the uh, Babylonian Talmud that describes Jesus performing acts of, you know, what they call sorcery, what we would call or more neutral parties might call miracles. Um, so, and 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 they're they're deep in in there. A lot of them are detailed in my book. So back to that back to Mary back to Mary Magdalene. We're, what we're doing at this point is we're setting the stage for um, setting sort of the context for Mary's behavior. So we have Jesus performing acts of magic. Performing, uh, performing miracles, condemning the Sadducees and the Fed and the and the Pharisees, making apocalyptic claims about the destruction of the temple. This made Jesus a target uh, of the religious orthodoxy and Pontius and Pontius Pilate. Something had to be done. The problem for Mary Magdalene. And uh, the disciples was their conspicuous association with Christ. His ideas made him increasingly popular among the masses. As a result, he was thought to pose a threat to the, the peace and the exclusive authority of the temple. If Christ was the Messiah, then Temple sacrifice would become superfluous. This, um, this would render the high priests of the Sadducees likewise um, uh, uh, superfluous. Um, and in my book, I go into greater detail about, of, 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 about, uh, about why. But um, the short version is that the resurrection of Jesus would have eliminated the 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 need for uh, temple sacrifice temple sacrifice because Jesus would have been that sacrifice. His his excuse me his the crucifixion of Jesus would have served as uh, that sacrifice to redeem um, redeem humanity. Uh, so Mary Magdalene and the disciples embodied uh, represented the embodiment of this threat. Silencing the leader and his movement became the first priority of the Sadducees. The capture and execution of Christ, the capture and execution of Christ, was calculated to send a message: all threats, all threats would be eliminated. This message seemed to have been received by the disciples. They scattered, but Mary Magdalene did not. After the trial and crucifixion, she had to know that the wrath of the Romans would next turn to the followers of Jesus. Mary, it seems, was um, in great danger living on borrowed time. Clearly, it would have been safer for her to flee Jerusalem with the disciples, but she did not. So the question becomes, what compelled Mary to deny the finality of the execution, um, the execution of Jesus Christ that she had just uh, witnessed? Why would she stay? What was she thinking? Had she become unhinged seeing the scourging and the beating of Jesus Christ? In spite of the apparent danger 
that she was that uh, that was present at the crucifixion. She followed the body to the burial uh, tomb. This is back up. Prior to his arrest, during his his ministry, we know that Jesus Christ predicted his death and that he would be resurrected three days three days thereafter. That's the first point. Second point, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea had become a follower of Jesus and had been given permission by Pontius Pilate to take the body of Jesus after the burial, uh, after the, excuse me, after the crucifixion. Mary, as a follower of Christ, knew this. And she also knew that the resurrection was to take place on the third day. Jesus, prior to his arrest, had already predicted that the disciples would scatter. He quoted Zechariah 13, 17, which said, they will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. This left Mary Magdalene and only Mary Magdalene. Every aspect, this left Mary Magdalene and only Mary Magdalene. Every aspect of the life and um, uh, the, the life of Jesus was foreshadowed, was, was foreshadowed in the Hebrew Bible. Why would it be silent on the resurrection of Jesus? I submit to you that it wasn't. Is it, is it so? So, and, and, and within the context of who resurrected Jesus, it is important that, that, that to note that God used a woman, the Virgin Mary, to birth Jesus. Jesus went to a human being, John the Baptist, to be baptized. Jesus proclaimed that he who believes in me and the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do. Resurrection was a part of the body of that work. Why would you, Jesus not rely on human being to, uh, on one of his followers to perform uh, the resurrection? It therefore should come as no surprise that he would use a flesh and blood human being uh, for the resurrection. So let us let, let's 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 sort of get our bearings. So far we've so far we've established this. We've established that Jesus did exist. We've established that he was ac accused of performing miracles. We've established that he was executed. On the cross, we've established that he was obedient to, uh, to death. And we've also established that immediately after his crucifixion, people began claiming, uh, began claiming that he had been resurrected. We have established that Jesus did not resurrect himself. We see that the Bible is already is all is all over the place in terms of who actually resurrected Jesus. We have narrowed the list of suspects to Mary Magdalene. At this, but at this point, um, there is a remaining hurdle that Mary Magdalene um, and all significant claims about the Messiah must get over. And that is Prefigure that that is um, um, prefiguration. What that is, that's the idea that all everything we claim about significant events in the in the life of Christ must have been predicted in the Hebrew Bible. Remember, Jesus said that he fulfilled that he fulfills prophecy. This means that the prophets had to describe um, if Mary Magdalene was the individual, was a person, was the individual responsible for resurrecting Jesus, it, there has to be a description of that somewhere in the Hebrew Bible. Again, uh, all major claims about the events and life of life and death of Jesus, including the crucifixion, resurrection, uh, are, pre, are previewed in the Old Testament. Jesus is all over the Hebrew Bible. 
the entire historic religious narrative of the Hebrew Bible addresses the coming of the Messiah. But there are specific prophecies, prophecies in the Hebrew Bible that make reference uh, to uh, the Messiah um, specifically. To establish that, so right, to establish that Mary Mag Magdalene resurrected Jesus, it is necessary to review uh, these, these. I'm sorry, to establish that Mary Magdalene resurrected Jesus, it is necessary to review the Hebrew prophecies of both Isaiah and Michael, Micah, as well as briefly review the Babylonian Talmud. This part of the review will establish how the Messiah was prophesied and what people were expecting to happen when he would appear. So we first look at Isaiah, Isaiah 714. And keep in mind, these biblical prophecies were written 700 years before Christ. Isaiah and Micah were both written 700 years before Christ. Isaiah 714 predicts that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. It says, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means um, uh, God. Isaiah 53 talks about the life, death, and scourging of the Messiah, including the puncture of his organs. It talks about the Messiah dying for the sins of man. Moving along to Isaiah 66, 7, it addresses, Isaiah 66, 7 addresses the painless virgin birth of the Messiah. This section describes the virgin birth of Jesus. 66, 7, Isaiah 66, 7 through 10 provides, before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man child, Jesus. The mother of Jesus cried or travailed after Jesus was born. Who has seen such a thing? Who hath, uh, who hath heard of such a thing? Who hath seen such a thing? The significance of this is that um, we know that labor pains are a part of the normal birth process. Mary did not experience it. Mary did, Mary did not begin to travail or express grief. She, didn't, she, she did not express grief or pain during the birth process of Jesus. Her travail came after Jesus was born. The reason that, um, that her, her travail came after was because she knew, Mary knew, uh, uh, of Jesus's ultimate plight that he was um, that he that that he was headed that he was headed toward uh, Calvary and that he would die a violent death for the sins of man. And so, this is not only me talking. This 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 is corroborated by religious luminaries such as. St. Augustine of, he, of, of Hippo, St. Thomas Aquinas, the Council of Trent, and many, many others support the painless birth idea advanced in um, Messiah. They each conclude, the, 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 the foregoing, each conclude emphatically that, in, that Isaiah 66-7 references the virgin birth of Christ, and that it was out that the virgin birth of Christ was without travail. We'll get to the, um, the further significance of that um, shortly. So the birth process, the birth process emerges as the key to solving the mystery of who resurrected Christ. Why? Why is this important? Genesis 3.16 says, reads, I will greatly multiply 
your pain in childbearing, pain you shall bring forth um, uh, children, in pain you shall bring forth children. This burden was imposed on humanity because of the sins of the 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 the, 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 the sins of Adam and Eve in the um, in, in the in the uh, Garden of in uh, in Eden. And so as a result of their sins, God determined that the birth process would be a painful process. So the, gar the Garden of Eden, Eden basically sets the stage for all this. But the mother, Mary, the mother of Jesus was exempt from this law because Jesus was not born of the seed of man. But Jesus was born with the seed of God. This is the Immaculate Conception. There were no labor pains associated with the virgin birth of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. This is important because this, be, this is important because any birth, uh, any birth we see described in the Bible where the woman is experiencing labor pain prior to the birth does not relate to uh, the birth of Jesus. There is a documented, this is, okay, and so this is also a documented messianic a prophecy in the Hebrew Bible that predicts that the Messiah, um, um, that, um, there's a document mentioning a prophecy in the Hebrew Bible that predicts it, that the Messiah and afterward predicts the pains of labor preceding the birth process. Birth is going to uh, have another, so this is good, there's going to be another appearance in this uh, uh, coming up. So, so let's step back and um, go back to the Jewish rabbinic, uh, rabbinic traditions, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie all this up. The, um, the Jewish rabbinic traditions and writings also predict the the, um, the, uh, the coming of the coming of the Messiah. Tractate 98b of the Babylonian Talmud, Talmud addresses uh, the Messiah. His name, and this was again written um, 700 years before the birth of Jesus. His name is the leper scholar, as it is written. Surely he has borne our surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And yet we esteemed him a leper smitten by God and afflicted. Tractate 2093b uh, maintains that Isaiah predicts the coming of that Isaiah, the passages that I wrote predicted the, become, the coming of the Messiah. And so why is all this important? What's important is prior to the birth of Jesus, there was a consensus about what all this meant. After the birth of Jesus, uh, that consensus uh, sort, of, sort of fell apart. So before there was a universal agreement that these were all messianic uh, passages um, that referred to the birth of the, the, the that referred to the, the uh, referring to the uh, coming of the Messiah. Um, a tractate a ninety three B maintains that Isaiah picks the coming of the Messiah. Uh, it is written that the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, understanding, and the Spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge of fear of the Lord and shall make him quick in understanding and fear of the Lord. That's basically the passage. Um, Isaiah 53, eight notes that by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And yet who his generation, who of his generation pro pro protested for he was from from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people, he was punished. 
this is a direct reference to um, the crucifixion of Jesus uh, Christ. In Isaiah 11, we see, seeing the light refers to, Isaiah 11 refers to seeing the light. Seeing the light refers to the re resurrection of the servant, resurrection of the servant from the dead because of his work. He will see the light and be satisfied in his knowledge that in the obedience of the covenant, his satisfied in his knowledge that is his obedience in the uh, relationship with the Lord. And so at this point, I cite support for avalanche of support that that too is a, a messianic uh, prophecy. We see here that, so, so we see here that uh, Isaiah addresses both the red we see here that um, we see here that Isaiah addresses both the crucifixion and the resurrection of the Messiah. It is a documented messianic prophecy. It follows the pattern of earth, death, and resurrection. We see that Micah is also a documented messianic prophecy. Michael, Micah follows the same birth, death, resurrection pattern, except Micah, unlike Isaiah, describes the person performing the resurrection as a woman in travail. And here we're getting into um, Hebrew Bible uh, prophet. Um, he, a Hebrew Bible prefiguring uh, Mary Magdalene resurrecting Christ from the dead. Uh, we already noted that Micah 2.5 is, is a recognized messianic text. Micah was written during the same period as was Isaiah. Uh, some of the, as a matter of fact, some of the passages in Micah and Isaiah are almost identical. But Micah 2 reads, Micah chapter 5, Micah 2 through 6 reads that as follows. But ye, O Bethlehem of Ephrath, who are the one of little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to rule Israel, whose origins is from old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who travaileth is brought forth. And so, it is from this passage, it is through this passage that we know that um, Jesus was to be born in Bethlehem. This is the only uh, passage supporting that idea. And so this is clearly a messi messianic text. It is universally, universally, it was universally believed that, um, that Jesus Christ would be born of, in Bethlehem and this passage supports is the um, the only where in the Old Testament that mentioned Bethlehem as a birthplace of Jesus Christ. So we know that this we know this to be a messianic passage. But for our purposes, Micah Micah five three is provides the critical support. Um, for my claim that Mary, that Mary Magdalene resurrected Jesus. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel. So we have juxt juxtaposition to a passage talking about the birth of Jesus, uh, then we have, therefore, he shall give them up until, until she who is in labor has brought forth. And so, so when, you, when, you, when you read uh, the, the uh, this passage in, 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 in various Hebrew texts, labor and travail have the same meaning. So 
to, to labor, you know how to talk about labor, you know what that means, per, uh, uh, pain related to the birth process. But it also has a dual meaning, pain and agony. And so, so this is the direct reference to, so it, it, and if you look at this, this would describe a normal birth process. Uh, it seems to describe a normal uh, birth process. It talks about he, she who was in labor, she who was in pain, bringing forth. But the labor that they're the, the, the labor that they're the labor and the travail that that is uh, that this is referencing is the labor and travail that Mary Magdalene experienced um, as a result of witnessing uh, Jesus during the Passion period. She witnessed the scourging of, of Jesus. She's witnessing beatings that, 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 that tore his skin apart. She witnessed the resurrection of Jesus. So this, she who is in labor brought, until she who was in labor brought forth. And so this is direct, uh, in my opinion, a direct reference to Mary Magdalene resurrecting uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus from uh, the empty tomb until she who is in agony, in pain, brings him forth. Now, remember, Mary Magdalene, as well as all the disciples, had the power to raise the dead. Why wouldn't she do it? Why wouldn't she? So this is biblical support. And so, so again, Micah 5.2 is, is recognized by authorities as a messianic prophecy. So we know that they're talking about um, the coming of the Messiah. We've already talked about Bethlehem um, um, and and so forth. So we know that this is a, a messianic prophecy. But Micah tells us more. Therefore, he will give them up. What does this mean? So what do we know? We've already talked about what Jesus mentioned, I think it was Zechariah, that when when uh, that that the disciples would scatter, um, it, it, it was a specific language that I, uh, when the when that when the shepherd is struck, the sheep will scatter. And so, what this passage says, therefore, he will give them up. So he will give them up is a reference to Jesus in, in, in this and in, and in, 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 Jesus, if you remember, for those familiar with the Bible, Jesus told his disciples at the Last Supper that he is going to leave them, that he is going to, to leave them, but that he would, in fact, return. The disciples didn't um, appreciate what he was saying, uh, uh, but he was directly referencing the fact that his arrests and uh, prosecution and crucifixion was imminent. And so this is a direct reference. This is a prophetic text that references what is going to happen. Um, therefore, he will give them up, notwithstanding the promise and great blessings, God will give, him, give, give them up, give up his people into the hands of the enemies or leave them to be exercised. And here's a critical language leave them to be exercised with troubles and afflictions. The troubles and afflictions uh, that, the, that Micah is prophesying here is the, 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 the affliction, the trouble that the, the disciples experienced um, once, they, once Jesus was arrested. And we, we've already established that out of fear, um, that they too would be prosecuted and put to death. They scattered to, they 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 abandoned Jesus and and scattered to, um, uh, to Galilee. 
But it goes on to say, until the appointed time of their, the, the, their deliverance had come. And so what this means is this, we've already talked about it, 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 it referencing the, the, the scattering of the disciples of Jesus. But it says, until the appointed time of their deliverance should come. The appointed time of their deliverance is a direct reference to um, the resurrection of Christ. And so there are parallels. Um, this, this, this section parallels um, Moses, who delivered the Jewish people from uh, Pharaoh. And, and we're, we're all familiar with that story. And so, so this is, this, but, but, but the, the language, until the appointed time of their deliverance uh, shall come, until that time, until, and then and it goes on to talk about the time when that she who delivers brought forth. So this is talking about the, the abandonment and the return of the, of the disciples after Mary, uh, Mary Magdalene announced the resurrection of Christ. The vehicle for deliverance of the people was the death and the resurrection of Christ. So what we see being described in Micah 5 is the resurrection of Christ or the bringing forth of Christ after his crucifixion. This passage describes the resurrection of Jesus by Mary Magdalene. Just as Moses, as I mentioned, Moses, um, uh, you know, I just already talked about the parallel text. Um, and so just yeah. Moses, and no. so just, I'm sorry. What, what's wrong, Charlie? Uh, we're running out to an hour. Maybe we ought to ask the speaker to proceed to a summary. Okay, um, so just as I, I, I can do that. Just as Moses delivered the uh, Jews from bondage of Pharaoh, Jesus, through his death and resurrection, delivered a man, a humanity from the bondages of, of the bondage of, of sin. This, of course, did not occur, did not occur until Mary Magdalene brought him forth or resurrected Jesus. Her travail was not the result of uh, the actual labor pains associated with a physical childbirth, but pain she experienced seeing Jesus beaten, crucified on the cross. By contrast, the Virgin Mary's travail was knowing that the birth of Jesus put him on, put him on a path toward um, uh, crucifixion. And so I that, um, um, you know, the, 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 the last point I'm, I, I wanna make, and, I, and I'll be brief here, is basically, so uh, Jesus basically, Genesis uh, or Calvary is really a redemption of Genesis. So the original sin uh, occurred in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve ate from the tree of, 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 of good and evil. And uh, the death of Jesus on the cross was to redeem humanity for those sins. And I will, I will, I will, um, I will close there. Okay. So, All right, now... Uh... We had about 10 stick around today. So who's got questions? All right, who's got questions? It's now our question and answer period. Please unmute and uh, feel free to join in the discussion. So uh, Patrick, what is what caused you to write this book or write this essay? Was, um, you know, I was at a point I was coming to terms with um, uh, my spirituality and, and religion, and I was um, I was uh, reading a lot of books on the life and death of Christianity, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and and you know I I I saw the writers, you know, the commentators saying things that 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 didn't sit well with me. Um, and some of them were believers, some of them were uh, non-believers. And, and so I started to do my investigation and, um, 
came to this conclusion uh, and decided to, to, uh, to write about it. I'm not a minister, um, uh, but I'm gonna tell you one thing, after, after doing the research for this book, I, I have to say I, I've become a believer a believer in the death and the resurrection of Christ. And um, I think that there is significant support, significant support uh, for uh, the fact that Jesus uh, actually performed the miracles that are described in the Bible and, and uh, the support for those propositions come from people who are who, who are not sympathetic to him for people who did not believe that he was the, uh, that Jesus was the uh, Messiah. All right. So basically, if I may summarize, then you believe in the death and resurrection of Christ, then, correct? Absolutely. Yes. And uh, my next question is do you practice or go to a Christian church of any kind recently or not? No, so 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 this all this all uh, occurred during um, during the pandemic. Okay. So I've made the decision as a result of this uh, that I am going to be baptized and um, uh, that 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 I want to be baptized. And um, I've had, I have a very good friend who. I had a lot of back and forth with uh, during the writing of this book. Who um, um, who sort of helped me along in, in that in that process? But but yeah, as a result of this, I believe uh, to to in the urban. I I believe that Jesus Christ was a real deal. And. Uh... Now, so what, what do you think you might do as a result of this, him being the real deal? How do you think it'll change your own life, if anything? I'm just curious. Um, you know, I... well, we're losing more people here. I'm sorry. I don't mean to. That's okay. Keep it. Go ahead, Patrick. I'm sorry. I don't know. I mean, sort of, um, you know, I, I'm 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 a believer. I I I I don't feel a calling toward the ministry or anything like right, that. Right, right, right. Um, um, I, I mean, is in terms of like for me, for example, okay, I go to my Christian church. I, you know, believe in prayer and and uh, believe in things like uh, having a relationship with God. I do believe in a calling. I do believe in certain things. I mean, I'm not going to agree with. Every one of my believers, as a matter of fact, me and a, another guy at my church, he happens to be a diehard Donald Trump fan, and I, I'm i not. I mean, it could be the source of a lot of argument between us, but we both agree, pray for the leaders above us, and, uh, you know, we have a lot more in common than we realize. Mm -hmm. I'd and, like to ask a question. And, you know, Charlie, let me finish first, okay? And then we'll get on. All right, Just hurry up, then. The reason I was just asking... <laughs> The reason I was just asking was, has it made a real impact as far as your own morality or your, your ethical stuff or your prayer life or anything else? That's what I was hitting at. And if not, you can just choose not to answer the question. Well, no, I don't mind answering the question. I, I mean, I, so, you know, I, I, I've always been ethical. I've always been a moral person. I, I, I believe that, um, I, I didn't have, I, you know, I, I didn't go to church. I mean, when growing up, we went to church periodically, basically on Easter and on, you know, some of the high, you know, high, high religious holidays, but, but um, nothing, nothing more than that. Um, and so I think I just, I, I, I'm at a point, I just have to decide what, what my belief means in terms of what I'm going to actually do. So what I, I was just curious. That's all. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 fine. I'm 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 drawn toward. Um, I like the body of information that that Catholics maintain, and so I am drawn toward um, uh, the uh, Catholicism in the Catholic Church. We'll see. 
my dad's been a Catholic believer for years, and there's a good active Catholic church by me called St. Margaret Mary's. It's pretty, but anyway, enough said about that. Charlie, go ahead with your question. Yeah, Patrick, is it quite possible that the reason the women remained in Jerusalem, unlike the apostles, is that the Romans didn't arrest women. They didn't accrue them the status of, if you wish, uh, co-conspirators. So they weren't, there was no fear on their part of being apprehended. You know, you know, you know. Obviously, you 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 have to um, you you have to allow for that. But if you track the movements of 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 Mary Magdalene and the level of attentiveness, her visits to uh, to the tomb, she's very close to uh, the mother of Jesus. Um, she went to the tomb on the, the on the day of the crucifixion. She helped clean the body of Jesus Christ on the day of, of the, this. This woman had an agenda. This woman had an agenda. But 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 let me me let me let me let me first. Yeah. So right. I think that you've hit on something because I believe that the the disciples knew of Mary Magdalene's involvement with the resurrection of Jesus Christ <sighs> because. Women could not testify in it. So may, back then, if you made a false claim about Jesus being the Messiah, you, could, you would be banished from the church. And so uh, the primary motive after the resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah, excuse me, the, uh, the disciples of Jesus wanted to spread this new gospel. And they could not spread the new gospel being banished from the church. And so if they had moved forward with their claim, um, you know, there, there, there wasn't a, a, a real receptive audience. They, they could have been, they, they, they could have been jailed. We know that after the, uh, the crucifixion of the, 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 the crucifixion of Christ, the, there was, the, there was a movement that galvan, galvanized around, uh, Christianity, things were happening, and as a result, Christians were being Christians were being prosecuted. And so, I think that um, that uh, rather than confronting the religious orthodoxy, uh, they prioritize uh, expanding the church. I know it's a long answer to a very pointed question, but. Still there, Patrick? Hey, absolutely, yes. I'm sorry, I just heard silence for a minute. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, I finished answering the question. Patrick, what do you think about this statement? Uh, I'm a practicing Catholic, and one of our rather high-level clergy here refers to Mary Magdalene as the apostle to the apostles. What would mm -hmm. you have to say about that? I'm, I'm in absolutely. I'm in absolute agreement with that. I think that um, the role that, first of all, it, it, by definition, Mary Magdalene was the founder of Christianity, and because she was the first person in a position, to, I mean, she witnessed the death and the resurrection of Christ, and she spread the word to the apostle. And, and, and so that's why they call her the apostle to the apostle because she was the first uh, person to be in a position to spread this new gospel. So I am in 100% alignment with, uh, with that. Um, this is uh, Curtis. All right. Uh, um, why is it that uh, nowhere in any of the apostles, in, in any of the epistles, the books written by Paul or uh, Peter or John, those who were with the Lord Jesus, why didn't they reference Mary Magdalene as being the one who uh, resurrected the Lord Jesus? And secondly, uh, the Apostle Paul and even Peter 
says that it was the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, who recognized, who uh, raised the Lord Jesus. Uh, why didn't the apostles reference or anywhere state that it was Mary Magdalene who raised them from the dead? No, I, I think that, and, and, I, and, I, and I, there's a chapter in my book, in my book about uh, the apostle Paul. I think Paul had a problem. Uh, I think that Paul had to really, first of all, I think that there was, that, that the apostle Paul had contact with Jesus prior to uh, his road to Damascus experience. It, it just it just it, it defies logic to suggest that he had a leadership role in the Pharisees. You look at the Bible; the Bible documents seventy four contacts between Jesus Christ and the Pharisees. Um, Paul says some things um, that suggest to me that he had contact with 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 Jesus. But Paul, Paul, in my opinion, because he he was, you know that Paul, as Saul, prosecuted uh, Christians. And so I think that Paul um, did not want to reveal a lot about his pre-conversion experience with the followers of Christ, because that would have only put him in a bad light. And, you know, you look at the Bible, you know, there was antipathy between a lot of the followers of Jesus and, and Paul. So um, Paul had the self mute. I don't know how much contact he had with, um, with Mary Magdalene, but at the time that this happened, Paul was, was opposed to uh, Jesus Christ in in his ministry, and so I believe that that um, that Paul. <laughs> that. Well, um, I'm I'm a little confused with your uh, with your response. There's no indication <laughs> either in the Bible is is there any any indication in his epistles, uh, not just Paul, but say Peter, uh, James. John, uh, why don't they mention Mary as <laughs> raising from the dead? And the second question I, I wanted to ask you, I'm reading the Gospel of John right here. Maybe you can explain this to me. Mm -hmm. uh, early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon, Peter, and the other disciples the one whom Jesus loved, she said, quote, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. Why would she say that if she's the one that raised him from the dead? This is what the Gospel of John said that Mary Magdalene said. She didn't know. Uh, why would she say something like that if she's the one that raised him from the dead? Well, that so, they have taken his body away and we don't know where they've laid him, where they put him. Why okay, would so, say something like that? okay, so let me let me answer the question. So I don't know if you heard my 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 presentation, but the Bible is all over the place in terms of who resurrected Jesus. Um, in Acts, it said that he was he was he was resurrected by the Holy Spirit. Uh, in John, it says that uh, that. Uh, Jesus resurrected himself. <coughs> where, can you show me where that is? Uh, yeah, where where John, he let says me, that? Let me, let me, okay, wait a minute. So Acts says that, okay, so wait a minute. Acts says, Acts 22, Acts 2, 24 says that God resurrected Jesus. Galatians says that it was the Holy Spirit. Spirit. John chapter 2, 19 predicted that says that Jesus raised himself. Romans 8.11 says that the spirit raised Jesus from the dead. And so there's no consistency. Um, there's, there's no consistency uh, within the Bible about, I mean, all these accounts can't be true. Well, how, how do you, 
Well, do you believe in the Trinity, that there's God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit? You don't see that those verses complement, that when it say the Lord Jesus raised himself, since he's deity, the Spirit of God raised him, and uh, uh, God raised him, it's all the same. I mean, since we have God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three distinct personalities, but one in essence. Well, but, but uh, I how, take it how, as, how do you explain Genesis one twenty six? I, I take it a step further. I, I take it a step further, so that um, if 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 Jesus gave his disciples the Holy Spirit um, and enabled them to to perform resurrection, that's still consistent with this. If if if, if, well, if Jesus if if Jesus gave if if if, if, if Jesus gave we know that Jesus gave his disciples the ability to raise the dead. Well, did they do that? With, I mean, again, turn to this passage. Mary ran and found Simon, Peter, and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus, she said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb. We don't know where they laid him. Peter and the other disciples started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. They stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside and he noticed the linen wrappings lying there while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded and lying apart. The disciple who had reached the tomb first went in and saw all of them went to this tomb. They were shocked that his body was not there. I don't see how, if they raised him from the dead, and some of them had the power to do that after the Spirit of God came upon him. Remember the Lord Jesus said when he descended, if he doesn't go away, the comforter wouldn't come. Well, the, 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 disciples didn't, the, the, disciple, the disciples didn't go to the tomb until Mary told them to go to the tomb. I know that, but why didn't they? So, why and, they so, and, and so the Catholic Church, let me just answer the question. The Catholic Church says... The Catholic, the Catholic Church in its encyclical said that Mary Magdalene was the first to see the, the risen Jesus. That means that she was at the tomb by herself. And so you're talking about things that happen after the fact. We're talking about a group of people trying to get a, a, a new theology off the ground. Given the time period, they were, they, a, a woman could not carry this message. And so there is... Um, the, the, the leadership role that Mary Magdalene played um, uh, was made secondary because of the fact that she was a woman. They could not push a religion uh, based on uh, the, actions of a, the, the actions of a woman. <clears throat> Charles, that makes a lot of sense. Now, <clears throat> do you think it's possible because the church is and Judaism was too, was so male hierarchical. It's kind of alluding to what you're saying. Uh, the, and there was jealousy, I think, among those apostles, probably jealous of Mary uh, Magdalene. Uh, is it possible that various scriptures were selected when the decision was made as to which ones were orthodox uh, in order to uh, downplay any role Mary had Mary Magdalene had in uh, your theory is that she was responsible for the resurrection. Is this possible? That I, I, I absolutely believe it is possible. I mean, we talk about, you're talking about the, the, the you know, they deemed her a prostitute. Yeah, I mean, that was all made up to they, negate they, her. They, um, right, they, they, they called her a prostitute and it wasn't until 1965 that excuse me, 1969, that the Catholic Church said that she was not a prostitute. I, of course, you know, uh, many things were said about her to diminish exactly. her importance. To diminish her, her absolutely, to uh, diminish her importance. And and they were prosecuting people for making claims that, uh, that, 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 that Jesus was the Messiah. And so they could not use Mary Magdalene because if they were to rely on, go to, they could not go to court relying on the testimony or the witness of Mary Magdalene because she was a female and as such could not testify in a, 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 a court. So the scriptures were written to advance a point of view or win an argument? 
Uh, I, I mean, it's it's hard to avoid that. Con, it's hard to avoid uh, that conclusion. That I believe, and I said at the outset, I don't think that uh, my theory um, uh, changes any of the fundamental principles of of Christianity. Um, but I think that there was a conspiracy uh, against women to downplay the role that women had in, in, this, uh, in, in, in this movement. Clearly, by anybody's definition, Magdalene should um, be uh, regaled as the founder of Christianity. She was the first person to be able to uh, recite the, the Christian creed with authority. The death and the rather, the, 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 the disciples weren't even at the, the crucifixion. She witnessed the death and the, 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 the death of Christ. She was at the resurrection of Christ. And so. Um, uh, I have a question. Where is Mary Magdalene in the book of Acts? You know, when they were, when Jesus told them to wait in the upper room and, and the Holy Spirit would come upon and give them power. Where is Mary Magdalene in the book of Acts? And uh, in John, why isn't she there in the book of Acts or somewhere? Why didn't she write some, uh, some books? Are there other books that was not chosen to be a part of the canon that mentioned Mary as being the one who raised Jesus from the dead? And why would the Apostle Paul say the Lord Jesus appeared to more than 500 people? And, but, and I know this is a lot. What, is, what, what does the 500 people have to do with this? Well, he, he, she wasn't the only one that he appeared to. He appeared to more than 500 people after he was raised from the dead. That's what the Apostle Paul says. But, I, I, I don't where think I've is, seen. Well, where is Mary Magdalene in the book of Acts if she's this important person? Uh, and the Spirit of God is the one who got it, who supervised the writings of the Bible. I believe the books that we have, the 66 books of the canon, were chosen by the Holy Spirit. And the individual books uh, were verbally inspired. The Holy Spirit supervised the writings. You know, if, if Mary Magdalene played this important role, where is she in the book of Acts? Why wasn't she in the upper room? She, she wasn't. She, 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 she. So, so when you talk about the upper room, the focus in the Bible is um, the upper room were all the, uh, where the, the Jesus and, he, and the 12 disciples uh, were congregated. But there were several upper rooms. There were several upper rooms. And so, <laughs> I mean, the one where the Holy Spirit came upon them, uh, uh, say there at Pentecost. Why isn't Mary mentioned that? But anyway, my last question, and I don't want to dog this. In John chapter 20, verse 11, mm. where Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene, Mary <laughs> was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. <laughs> she saw two white robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the head, <laughs> where Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. That does not sound like somebody who actually raised him from the dead. If she did that, she would know where he was all along. But this doesn't happen. And she even went on from there to the garden and was talking to the Lord Jesus and didn't recognize him until he revealed himself to her. I, I well, mean, I'm, not, I mean, I'm if, trying if, to figure out where, where if, are you if, basing if, this so, on in scripture? Everything in the Bible that I'm seeing contradicts everything you say. Everything you say. <laughs> How do you explain this the way Mary Magdalene act when she said, they have taken away the body of my Lord. I don't know where they have laid them. How do you explain that in light of somebody who raised him from the dead? So these narratives, these, these narratives uh, didn't begin to show up 
until more than 40 years after these, 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 these gospels were not written uh, contemporaneous with the events that, that are right. Some of these, some of these, some of these gospels, um, the earliest of these gospels didn't show up until 40 years, 40 years later. But and the story, let me, let me, let me, let me finish, let me finish, let me finish. And so we already, well, you may or may not agree. I think that there was a, a concerted, concerted effort by the, the, the writers of these Gospels to downplay the role uh, that Mary Magdalene played. You look at the Gospel of Phillips. In the Gospel of Phillips, it says, Jesus, why do you, why do you prefer Mary over the rest of us? The Gospel of Phillips talks about Jesus um, uh, teaching things that, uh, teaching Mary things that, sh that he did not, uh, that he did not uh, teach the other disciples. And so there's a wider narrative uh, <laughs> uh, uh, here. And um, so well, I, I, obviously, I, obviously you believe in the inerrant word of, of the Bible. I, I believe that, that, that there are inconsistencies in the Bible um, uh, that, that have to be managed. I believe that the Catholic Church has gone uh, gone a long way to correct some of the misinformation in the Bible and correct some of well, the female bias in the Bible. And so, okay, that that understand. I didn't listen to your entire lecture. I couldn't disagree with you more on what you just said, but I appreciate the discussion. I'll finish when we get to the point where I can talk. You know, and and. Uh, after you finished answering questions. I couldn't disagree with you more. Yes, I believe in the inerrancy of scripture and the Holy Spirit supervised the 66 books that were chosen. The one that was written by Philip, the, 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 those who compiled the books of the Bible had a way of verifying the authenticity of the books of the Bible. So and that wasn't genuine, the one Philip. It wasn't genuine and but even though but, these what's your definition of genuine? Was, what, what's your definition of genuine? I mean, it wasn't authentic. It wasn't written by an apostle. Otherwise, it would have been included in here, the Gospel of Philip. I haven't read that. I read it through, but there are several other writings that the early church fathers proved to be apocrypha, proved to be None Not of these genuine. gospels. The, the, wait a minute. None of these gospels were written by the actual disciples. The disciples. Yes, they were. That's not write. true. They could not read or write. How? How, how is it? That, how is? What, how? How is it that they? <laughs> what John is writing here is supervised, <laughs> even though it was written decades after the event. All of the books in the they were, they were not written by the disciples. Bible record events. They talk about events that happen before the writings. Otherwise, they couldn't write about it. The Gospel of John, I think something was written. Well, then why does, the, that not, why does that not apply to Philip? But, why does that not apply to the Gospel of Philip? Why does that not apply to the well, Gospel of Mary Magdalene? I mean, well, you'll have to go back and look at, you, you'll have to go back and look at those and compare and say, take a look at the Council of Nicaea, the council that compiled the books of the I'm Bible. I'm familiar with the Council of Nicaea, but I'm also familiar with the fact, were... excuse me, I'm also familiar with the fact that the disciples could not read or write. And so they did not write these gospels themselves. They were written. No, that's not their... true. That, that's, well, okay, well, okay. that is not true. I, okay. I couldn't... What, what's what's okay, your, support okay. where, where, your support just... for that? Where's your support for that? Where's your support for that? I'll wait until they, they actually wrote it. Well, the, the, they stated. Right, they stated go. Paul, Paul wrote his epistles. There's no question. Who's that, Charles? Yeah. Or is yeah, that Tim? It here. There's my end. Is, I'm not. It says it in each at the beginning of each of the books. It tells you who wrote them, like the Book <laughs> of Acts was written by the physician Luke. Luke was written by Luke, and Acts was written by Luke. Peter okay. right, states it himself right. that he wrote it. All right, but, right. but anyways, the anyway, yes. are according to whatever. According that is. to gospels, it, according yeah, Old Testament. New Testament. Write these gospels, and if you think, if you think they wrote these gospels, 
if, if you think that they wrote these gospels, if you think that these gospels were written contemporary, some of these gospels were written after they were after the alleged authors were dead, the alleged authors who could not read or write. There is no question but that they no. could no, they did how, not write where's your proof of that? Oh. Where's your proof of that? How do you prove that? Where, where can I go and find that information? The source. The oldest, the oldest extinct copies of the of the scriptures are quite old, about 80 years old at least. So and they were written in Greek. These, 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 these they weren't Greek. <laughs> Greek, some in Greek and Aramaic. Very but little again, was written in back to very very uh, little was in Aramaic. Okay. Oh, I got a question. Uh, go ahead. Mary Magdalene, I'm not much of a Christian. Maybe you guys can help me out here. If Mary Magdalene was the great pivotal figure of Christianity, I was always led to believe it was this guy Paul because he wrote all these letters clarifying theological issues, if I'm correct. And that's why his letters are read at religious services even today, aren't they? You're absolutely right. I mean, there's no question. I mean, the, the authenticity of the Pauline epistles is, 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 is well established. I mean, out of the 26 books of the Bible, I think he wrote more than, uh, more than uh, the, the half of them. So, but the dominant role that, that, uh, that Paul played does not diminish the large role that Mary Magdalene played. I mean, they're not mutually exclusive. I'm still trying to reconcile, you know, as, as you, anytime I quote a passage of scripture in the gospels, sure they were compiled decades after because the Holy Spirit supervised the writer. That's how we got the Bible. Second Timothy, Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture, which means inspiration, which means God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for reproof, for correction, and so on. But all scripture given by inspiration, that word inspiration means God breathed. The Holy Spirit, who's the third person of the Godhead, supervised their writings, told them what to write. That's the only way you can find predictive prophecy. It's, it's the only oh, way you can so, find So, so here, here, here's a problem with that. Here, here's a problem. 5-3 that was written centuries even before the event happened. Micah 5-3, O Bethlehem Ephrata, out of thee shall he come forth whose goings have been from everlasting to everlasting. That came out of the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 3, that was written five to 700 years before the birth of Christ in Bethlehem. How did he get that? The Holy Spirit revealed it to them. They were writing things they didn't understand because they were putting down what God himself, the Holy Spirit. You, you obviously them. didn't see my presentation. I yeah. talked about Micah. No, he so, was around. I saw him here. I got in on the last end. Okay, so right. You did, you obviously, I, so I made specific reference to Micah. I made specific reference to, to the fact that it was written 700 years before, but it was a part of the oral uh, th these things were not reduced to writing until after the fall of the, uh, the, the the temple in Jerusalem. Hello? I think I lost you. Hey, Tim, I got a question. Uh-oh. Uh, Tim. There we go. Tim, can you hear me? Tim, you're muted. How about that, Bob? A bit better? I just had okay. my mic turned off. All right. So I got a, I got a question here. This is a, this is a, well, this is a couple questions maybe, but just kind of some general uh early christianity history because I, I tell you i'm not a i was i was baptized catholic but that's about as far as i went uh so nowadays we're hearing a lot of uh uh people talking about slavery and reparations and all this oh you know maxine waters and Corey bratton and all these people but you know, slavery slavery's been around since as, as far back as we have any knowledge. So back there in those early, you know, that time of Jesus, who were the enslaved people? Who enslaved them? And how did they get free? Did and did religion did, did, did Christianity have anything to do with freeing them? 
And if you can, if you can follow all that, then and where and where what are those groups of people today? And if I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I want to introduce a question from somebody on Facebook who is asking about Luke 15. If, I, if either of you want to comment on Luke 15. Who just left us? Oh, never, never mind. <laughs> well, we still have Curtis. Yeah, I know. Um, well, here's, I, let me tell everybody who's on the call what I have going on. On my side, there's a uh, Facebook you know, uh, channel for libertarians of Illinois. And there is, you know, a person okay. who a lot of people would regard as a troll who is putting up some posts. And I invited him to join the uh, call, but he has not accepted the invitation. But his uh, post, and it wasn't his original post, but it's something that he shared. It says, if you are a Christian and you can't, and can't hear can't lives matter, without feeling the need to respond with the criticisms that all lives matter, then crap crack open your Bible and open up Luke 15, which talks about how Jesus left the 99 sheep to go after the one sheep. Hey, Charlie, did our speaker leave? I think our speaker left, didn't he? Charlie, hopefully just, he comes back. I'll repeat my question if he comes back. Because I hope he does. I hope it wasn't mad or anything. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah, please. there was a uh, there was a podcast that I was listening to a little while ago, and it wasn't a podcast that I listened to often. But they were talking about how the last time that they had a recording, one of the hosts had to abandon the podcast because his home was getting uh, you know ransacked, like robbers had broken into his home. So, okay, we have Patrick back. All right, I'll repeat your question for Patrick. So, Patrick, can you hear me? He's connecting to audio. You got it. I'm back here. Okay, so uh, there is a question I got from somebody on Facebook who wants to know if you're familiar with Luke 15 and the whole idea of Jesus leaving the 99 to go after the one. We were talking about Black Lives Matter uh yeah um, um so don't leave us ken okay luke um excuse me luke 9 15 or 10 15 you said i so think luke, luke 15 so luke 15 okay i have it up on a separate computer here the parable of the lost sheep I'm sorry, I just got a phone call from somebody else. So it's called the Parable of the Lost Sheep, the Luke yeah, 15. If you can take over for me for a second. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll read it briefly. It's called Now the tax collectors and the sinners were gathered all around to hear Jesus when the fair, but the Pharisees of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on the shoulders and goes home. He then call he then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, "Rejoice with me! I have found my lost sheep." I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety nine righteous persons who does need, not need to repent. Or so, or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, I believe what Ken was saying, uh, any one of you who says black lives matter and, and, and cannot respond to say that all lives matter. Uh, what are your thought co comments and thoughts on that, Patrick? I believe what Ken's saying. Okay, so so this is uh, this is way outside the, the the topic of my speech, but 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 I'll but I'll, but I'll, but I'll take a side. If so, if <laughs> the problem with all lives matter is if 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 all lives matter now, all lives should have mattered during. I mean, I mean at what point did all lives matter? Be, did all lives begin to matter? Was it during? Uh, the time uh, that, that 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 blacks were in involuntary servitude. Uh, did all lives matter during the time that blacks were segregated in ghettos? Uh, did all lives matter when black people could not uh, 
go to public parks or um, uh, did, did all lives matter when blacks had to go to the back of the bus? At what point did all lives begin to matter? I agree with, I agree with that. If, I'm, if I could answer that some too. I was reading in the BuzzFeed today, guy written a book about uh, modern day sundown towns. They still exist. You've got to read that article in BuzzFeed. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's still plenty of, most of them in the Midwest, but there's still towns that you've got to be out of uh, by midnight. But people who don't know what's meant by Black Lives Matter is Black Lives Matter too. It's exactly. not saying all lives don't matter. If I was marching, I would have a sign, all lives matter, including Black lives. You cannot take a look at the police shootings. If all, I mean, what George Chauvin, what, what Chauvin did, what Michael Slager did to uh, Walter Scott, the whole protest should have started over Michael, what Michael Slager did to Walter Scott, shooting him in the back and placing the gun down next to him. I mean, there's so many examples to where black lives don't matter as much as white lives. Then anybody who asks that question really have, you, you, you really have to be out of touch. It's not saying that all lives don't matter. And if you think that all lives matter the same, then do that experiment that a white guy did decades ago where he chemically dyed his skin black and toured the country as a black man and saw the difference, how he was treated compared to when he was white. But all the statement is saying, it is a statement that's focused on police brutality. All lives matter, including black lives. Uh, black lives matter too. I mean, all of the police shootings that you, you, you've seen, people walking into black churches, bombing and burning them and killing people in churches like that, the 100 years of Jim Crow and segregation, You've got the white community saturated with violent, racist, white supremacy groups uh, uh, that nobody says anything about today, what happened on January the 6th. You, there's so many instances of police brutality, killing unarmed black men and women and walking away scot-free, that you cannot say that all lives are treated equal. That's, a, that is a, that's simply a hyperbolic rhetoric or something to hide behind. But uh, anybody that asked that question really don't want to know the truth. Right, exactly. I agree. I, I, Robert, I, I, how, how does that tie in with the, with the lost sheep? I don't, I don't get the drift with the, you know, like, the 99 who get the one sheep. What is, what is, how does that tie in with Black Lives Matter? God's saying it's that uh, live, you know, for one, he, he uh, I, I honestly think that that whole parable there also, if you look further down, that's the same uh, tale as a prodigal son. You know, one son stayed at the house and the other one went out and spent his inheritance. But when he came home, the father was welcoming. I think that says to Jesus, uh, you know, he welcomes everybody, you know, and, and sometimes he has to work a little extra hard to bring in somebody who is far away. And when he brought him in, okay. Lost. So anyway, can we get back, now can we get back to my my original question. Now, who who were the enslaved people in Jesus's day, and uh, who who enslaved them, and where are they today? Oh, and did religion end it, help end it, or end it? And who are who were those people, and who are they today? Who what population are they today? Bob, I can answer that. I'm going to talk about that uh, in August. Uh, well, I want to hear from yeah, somebody. Yeah. They're talking captives about of <laughs> war were the normal source. What's that? Cab war captives. Oh, war captives. So and now uh, you could get into slavery by debt, but in the Roman Empire, 25 to 50, at least 25 to 50 percent of the people were slaves. So who were the slaves in the in the in Jesus's times? Like I, I don't know the demographics. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it didn't follow lines of demographics. It was, you know, the, the, the Romans were marching, you know, all over the earth and, and, and they were, they were uh, all over the planet and there were people that, there were nations that they conquered and, yeah. and some of them were enslaved. So these weren't, these weren't slaves based on race. These no. were no. conquered peoples. Now, we're, now Jews were slaves at one time, correct? Yes. Absolutely. 
And when when were they when were they uh, let's say freed? When was their June? When's the Jewish Juneteenth? Uh, that would probably be the Jewish Juneteenth. I'd probably say would be Passover, wouldn't you say, Curtis? I, no, I don't. I don't. Uh, you'd have to ask, say, somebody in Judaism. I don't know that, but if they thought that that was a significant mark, I'm sure they have a they have a piece of something. Passover is a celebration of the, the 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 freeing of the slaves from Egypt. Okay, I, I think that was uh, Passover, wasn't it? Or yeah, that was Passover. Yes. The so, the, so the Egyptians were the slaveholders. Yes, and the Jews well, were the slaves. Now, did they, right. did they did they trade in these Jewish slaves? Like, if I was a so my family was from uh, from Italy, from Chieti, Italy, about seventy five miles west of Rome. Could they buy some uh, Jewish slaves? Well, uh, Bob, according no to what I see, slaves. there were no Jewish slaves, and they weren't in Egypt either. You guys are way off. No, 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 no. You need to watch the movie Patterns of Evidence that show oh, all, oh the archaeological, all of the archaeological evidence that show Jewish people were at one time enslaved in Egypt. They no, even, absolutely they, not. Yes, they, if you could and, find, I've been they, an archaeologist for 25 years. If no, you could find one artifact that establishes the Jewish Well, let people, me give you one. Let me, I'll let give me, you $100,000 for it. Let me give you one. Uh, oh, there let, isn't me, any. let me give you one. Egyptian papyrus was found with the names of Hebrew slaves on them and even the names of some of the 12 sons of Jacob. It was found there in the city of Avaris, which is beneath the city of Ramses. I challenge you to watch the film that documents all of this called Patterns of Evidence, where they document- I don't want to watch a film. I've been reading about this. So you don't want to watch film because you don't want to give a hundred thousand of your capitalist dollars away. No, no Egyptian, it's papyrus not cool. been, Egyptian papyrus have been found that have the name of Hebrew slaves on them. You can look that up. That's a fact. No, they even found not. the city where those 12 sons of Jacob were buried in a virus and the tombs and even Joseph's tomb there. Now, now by the Jews you don't want to know that. See, there's yeah, evidence. If you really people, wanted to find yeah. if you give the truth, you would go and look up what I just told you. Okay, now I have a library that I know about archival documents. <laughs> so Charles, uh, yeah. else, you know, I wish I could stay for this here. I've got to run to get to a store before. Ernest, I want to thank you because I had to jump off for a little bit, but I came back. Lot and lot uh, I haven't gotten a response to your response, but thank you, Curtis. Thank you, Patrick. For answering my question and thank you for joining the call. Just come back yeah. again. We might we might still be in this for a while. So yeah, yeah. Right, I'm, yeah. I'm, I actually gotta run out to Home Depot here before they close and a best buy to get some ink cartridges to do They're some. They're the only tonight. place you can rent a car from right now. Well, no, I mean, <laughs> some ink cartridges, but uh I appreciate this. I enjoyed the discussion and I'm gonna go back and dig through some things, but I, I respect the uh author you speak of. Uh, I just happened to email, Curtis. I got some stuff I want to share with you offline. Yeah, I yeah, just happened to. I'm going to put in chat here real quick. Yeah, I have happen to strongly disagree. I've got to run, guys. I'll talk to you later. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Curtis. I appreciate your comments. Okay, now I should chat Curtis real quick. Oh, I'm sure he'll come back. Well, well you no. can email it to him too. Hey, Tim, I want to ask you how I can get a copy of the uh, videos. They oh, recorded okay. these. But the thing is, I got links to them. I'll. I'll uh, Talk to me Monday. I'll send you a link. I mean, I got them on. I got them okay. from archive, but I just haven't posted them to YouTube yet. I got right. them in October of last year, so I'll be posting them. But just if you want to send me a link, and I'll get you a Zoom archive link on. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I got, Patrick. I got a few more, few more little questions here about some early Christian history. Now, Jesus had a brother named James. I understand. Is that the same James that was the Apostle James, or is that a different James? Well, so so the the brother of Jesus, James, the brother of Jesus, came into the. He, I don't think he was a believer during Jesus' life, but um, uh, he became a believer after the resurrection, and then he led the uh, the Church of Jerusalem. So he was not a. Uh, he was not a. He was not the Apostle James, and that was a different James. Is that correct? Yeah, 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 yeah. His is is is. Well, he might have been an apostle after. I mean, apostle is 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 someone who is 
you know, who, who spreads the word. And so, I mean, but isn't there a book of James or something though uh, in the Bible? Yes, there is. What's that? Uh, yes, there is a book of James. I'll pull it up real quick. But that's not James, the brother of Jesus. That's a different James. Uh, I'll know in a minute. I, I can answer this in a minute. Um, you know, the thing is about this internet, you can and always find this. And also, uh, what, what, whatever became of Mary Magdalene? Did she ever marry and have kids or uh, whatever happened well, to her? Yeah, some people say that she ended up uh, in, um, in, in, in France and that she started a movement in France. And if you go to France, there are a lot of uh, monuments to her. Uh, the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus, is said to have ended up in Britain. And if you go to Britain, there are a lot of monuments to her. Uh, the claim is that her grave, that she actually died in Britain. And, um, and, and so there, there are several monuments to, to, to her in Britain. So. Well, why, why would they have left and gone to Britain and France? Because that, they were followed, that, because, I'm sorry, go ahead. That's conspiracy stuff, the Holy Grail. <laughs> of Jesus, the descendants of Jesus, the Illuminati. That's not valid. You could be right. You you might be right. I'm, I'm just saying that there is um you know I, I can't say that you're wrong. I'm saying that um this is well um, that's that's uh that was at that book and that movie that came out. Da uh, Vinci Code. Yes. Da Vinci well, Code. Yeah. So, the bloodline so Jesus, of Jesus is is. So Jesus Christ comes back. Blood. So Jesus comes back from the dead. How long is he around before he disappears again? And then he never comes back. Well, he resurrected right away. He went straight up. No, uh, no, no, no. He, he no, didn't no, go he straight came up. Back uh, no, he, he came back. He ministered to. That's when he. You know, somebody asked the question: When did he did, did he uh, see the five hundred? He came back. He went to. He 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 met with his disciples. Um, Thomas, remember doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas touched the wound of Jesus. Right, right, right. So how how long was he back before he left again? And then never to return. Never to return. Uh, well, I, not never. I I thought five hundred people didn't actually see him. They said something like, "Jesus is in this room." Can you see him or sense him? And a bunch of people said, yes. Yes, I can sense he is here with us. That, that's what they're talking about. All right. Yeah, you know, I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah, this whole thing is, uh, you know, a little sketchy, if you ask me. Um, we you, don't really know if he was really dead when he brought him down. For me. Maybe he was hanging on by a thread and maybe... For three days, maybe Mary Magdalene, you know, nursed him back, you know, uh, back to good enough health where he can walk around and show people his wound. What do they call it? The Peter conspiracy or something? Yeah, well, yeah, there, there, there is a conspiracy. Uh, there's a book about a novel written years ago. Uh, the day is called Jesus Rises from the Dead. And according to what I'm reading now, it's uh, Ascension Day. Uh, it is believed that after Jesus' resurrection, he spent the next 40 days teaching his Tim, disciples. we're talking about Jesus didn't die. There was a novel written. I forget the name of it. It's like the Peter Principle or something. Nobody dies. It's first, first, nobody dies according to the scripture either. Tim, he didn't rise, have an ascension because physically he wasn't dead. Well, Charlie, according to scripture, nobody dies. They just go to either heaven or hell. There's a theory. Will you listen? I'm listening. It's not the Peter Principle. I know what the Peter Principle he was is. He's not dead. And they helped him recover. And it, it's one theory among many. But no one's given it any credibility. It was fiction, fiction book. Yeah. Whatever you called it, it's not the Peter Principle. I can tell you what the Peter know. Principle is. <laughs> I don't know. The Peter Principle <laughs> is somebody gets hired. And eventually they get promoted and they get promoted again and they get promoted once again until once, uh, you know, finally they reach a position that they don't have the skills for. This is what has happened to Joe Biden. Well, there was a novel that Jesus was 
But he hadn't died. And so they took him down and took him to oh, help him recover, oh, like regular medical. Otherwise known as a swoon theory. Oh. Did you say that's what happened to Joe Biden? That's what I think happened to Joe Biden. He just got promoted and promoted until he just, you know, we finally found the position that, oh, he can't do this. Are you a Trump guy? I'm not a Trump guy. I'm a Joe Jorgensen guy. I'm a libertarian. Okay. I got libertarian signs up here. Yeah, I know. I, uh, I, oh, okay. All right. All right. <laughs> I voted for uh, myself. I voted for uh, Johnson and Weld in 2016. I voted for a Joe in 20. So I, you know, Joe, we Joe. that in common. <laughs> anyway, um, well, well, the, I wanted to ask our speaker, is he still here? No, he's, he's, still here. Here. he's still here. Okay, they had the Apostles' Creed. And I was wondering, there's no reference to Mary Magdalene. Was that by design or on purpose? Well, I mean, the Apostles' Creed, the, the Apostles Creed I mean, it doesn't reference... You know, I, I talked about the Apostles' Creed. And so... I mean, yeah. You know, I don't, I don't think that that's something that where they would, they would mention. All the, right, I've got a question. You talk about resurrecting somebody from the dead. Yeah. And I would presume this. I, I don't fully understand this. Don't you have to have like the power to do it? And you're saying somebody could learn how to do it. They were well, taught. so according to scripture, uh, Jesus, and this is the, the, the Holy Spirit, and there are people that are a lot more qualified to talk about this than, than me, but Jesus uh, gave his disciples the power to do that, the power to raise the dead, to heal the sick, to cast out, uh, cast out demons. Yeah, that's the Pentecost. Uh, yes, that 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 is the Pentecost. But um, he did it uh, at one point before um, before his uh, crucifixion. The Pentecost happened after the uh, the resurrection. Um, I have a friend that I that that lot knows a lot more about this, and we go back and forth. So. This is more his area of expertise, so I, I uh, uh -huh. defer to him on this. Well, anyway, um, I got a I got a quick question for you guys. Um, I I want to share with you a real quick picture. I'm wondering if you think this might be a representation of Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get a little levity in here. Never mind. Never mind. I would not be a member of any church that would not welcome that as a you know way to welcome members in it. Let me let me. I'm gonna go ahead and share that to my uh, St. John's page <laughs> if I can. My pastor could stop laughing, and he says, "Don't show it around the church, though." He could. So stop I go laughing. to this uh, Lutheran church online, St. John's in downtown. It's in my precinct, and I've been attending the online services for a long time. Uh, the pastor is leaving. I actually caught his last sermon last uh, Sunday, so I'm looking forward to seeing what the you know interim pastor has for us tomorrow. Right. But uh, this last guy was very, very relatable and very, very funny. He looked a lot like the Cash Cab host. If you've ever seen the TV show Cash Cab, yeah, he did. I met him in person a few times. Yeah, right? Brian Lee. Yeah, I met him there. I yeah. would attend sometimes. My friend Paul. I was astonished to find out that he is five years younger than me. <laughs> he was going to uh, college in 2002. He put up on Facebook, and I had I had no idea that I was older than him. It's one of those things where I realized, okay, I still have you know non gray hair, but I'm getting damn old. <laughs> I got another question for Patrick. All right, Patrick, go ahead. You got another question, Charlie? Go ahead. Yeah, now, uh, I read an article uh, in a journal that Jesus was a composite figure of 18 different individuals. Uh -huh. 
And have you run across that? I mean, they, it, it's common after the life of Confucius, the life of Buddha, and the life of Jesus, and even Muhammad, they tried to piece together incidences of their lives. But one would think that all sorts of things would enter the narrative uh, regarding the life of Jesus. Uh, isn't that quite possible? Um, I mean, you know, I suppose anything is possible. Um, you know, I mean, there, there are all sorts of theories, um, you know, about, you know, who Jesus, who, who Jesus Christ was. Um, so, I mean, I don't really know. I mean, other than that, I, I don't know how we can how we can add to that. I'm not necessarily bothered by the idea of Jesus not necessarily being a actual person who I you know was around back then, but is could still come around. I'm a Lutheran, and I really identify with the. Uh, as a libertarian also the uh the whole idea of martin luther going and posting on the church door like hey a letter here like you th you you have this wrong here's what you need to address and i feel like that wasn't only something that happened back then but it's something that should happen now as well you don't need to follow all of the doctrine to be a member of the church yeah. I don't tithe, I'll tell you that. I don't give 10% of my income. I'm not giving 10% of my income to anybody. Why don't we, <laughs> uh, allow, or anybody. <laughs> why don't we allow the speaker to give a, a summary if you'd like? And let's wrap it in. What about what about, uh, what about uh, rebuttals, Charlie? Anybody got a rebuttal tonight? You think or? Not? I, I think we were way beyond that. What? I'd ask if anybody wants, but has anybody got a rebuttal tonight or not? I put in what I had to say from the guy on Facebook, and he has not responded. So we okay. will assume that Jeremy Chapnick yeah, I only have has one nothing to say. To say. Okay. I do. Go ahead, Charlie. No. Oh. Uh, there was some reference there to prophecies. Um, and there were, I'm not an expert on this, but there were all sorts of prophecies regarding the Messiah. And in early Christianity, there was a period there where they, they hadn't quite decided issues regarding Christ. Was he a man? Was he a, a portion of a man? Think what is his nature? Um, various explanations came about, which were later called heresies. Now, it's been the God. Many of you may already know this: that the Gospels were written later, and they obviously had to show to establish the divinity of Jesus as the Messiah, that he fulfilled the prophecies. The most classic one, the two stories of Jesus' birth, there probably isn't anything historically accurate about either of those stories. They were added on later to two of the gospels. Now that's some maintain, we've had a speaker in the college you went word by word through uh, scriptures that pertinent. Like here, he had to be at the house of David. And so they have him traveling to Bethlehem, which would establish his being a member of the house of David. But that's what I mean. So were these stories written to verify or fulfill scriptures? We don't know. Um, but you have to keep that in mind. That's 
that's the thing about how these were written. Uh, also, there were disputes uh, among early Christians. Um, and finally, the scriptures were, if you wish, stylized to present an answer <laughs> to the question, to settle any questions that were there. So that's what I mean. You've got to look at these carefully. Um, I've actually spent many years looking in search of the historical Jesus. Uh, Albert Schweitzer, notably uh, the, the guy, the figure from missionary work, um, was a leading scholar on this. Also, they had a, a Jesus scholar at the Paul, the Jesus Project, um, which is very, if you, a very famous project to establish uh, whether or not scriptures were accurate or not. Uh, so things regarding the resurrection, I vaguely recollect as among the theologians, there virtually was no agreement as to what actually happened. They could agree on other parts of the life of Jesus. But when it came to that, I do recollect that uh, there was absolutely no agreement whatsoever regarding the circumstances of that. And I'll leave it at that. Very good, Patrick. Thank you very much. You seem to put in a lot of time and effort. And we appreciate your speaking here tonight. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the invitation. And um, I'm going to be uh, uh, following you guys uh, in the lineup. I, I, I'm on the mailing list. And so um, I will I will see you guys soon. All right, Patrick. Uh, listen, I thank you for coming in. All right. Since nobody else has a rebuttal, Patrick, you got the last word. I think you just put it in. Otherwise, what we'll do is I'll just... Uh, um, uh, officially stop the recording and then we can chat for a little while afterwards if you'd like. So this will conclude tonight's College of Complex.